Hi guys and welcome. This is a, a new podcast we've uh, recorded recently when we were travelling over in the States. Uh, we were introduced to retired Colonel Ramon Tony Nadal, it goes by the name of Tony, uh, by Major General Ken Bore, who's a good friend of the team and we were staying uh, with him and working with him while we're over there in the States. And uh, one afternoon I got the chance to call uh, Tony and uh, record an hour's interview with him, which you're about to watch. And what makes this special is is um, he was based um, in US Special Forces and he'll go into uh, how that came to be. And in 1963, he was the 18 commander um, at the Nam Dong camp. And Nam Dong camp is, is famous because the first uh, Medal of Honor in the Vietnam War was was awarded to uh, Roger Donlan, who was the uh, the um, the A Camp commander who who uh, succeeded uh, Tony. Tony trained him up, and he talks a little bit about that. So we we cover that for about the first uh, half an hour or so, and then we get into how Tony managed to wangle his way into the first battalion of the of, of the Seventh Cavalry. Uh, which he did in 1965, and then he deployed with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hal Moore's uh, uh, battalion. And you'll, if you watch the film We Were Soldiers, um, Tony is the is played by an actor, and you can tell it's him on LZ X-ray in the battle because he's actually got the Special Forces flash on his on his shoulder, and he's the only uh, guy you'll see. With that flash during the battle, and for you know, for obvious reasons, the rest of the guys are cavalry. So uh, Tony's going to give you his account, his personal uh, account of being in the battle, of of leading a company, including you know a bayonet charge, and um, you know trying to get his guys back and and losing guys, and it's it's kind of a full on personal account of of his battle. Uh, he's he's given uh, lectures to war colleges on this battle. So um, he, he's the best guy to explain it, I think. He's, he's really spent a lot of time thinking about it. Uh, for those that have obviously watched the film, uh, you'll be able to um, listen to this and then maybe re-watch it and, and get a different insight into it, um, having heard from a first-hand uh, account. Um, towards the end of the podcast, uh, Tony talks about his time going back to Vietnam and meeting the NVA guys that were opposing him on the day during the battle and I think that's quite a moving part of the podcast. So anyway, I hope, I hope you enjoy it and, and we're very grateful to, to Ken and Tony for organising the interview and, uh, um, and and here it goes. I was commissioned in uh, June of 1958 right at West Point. And, and it, there wasn't really a sort of known special forces then uh, because of, it, you know, it was kind of Kennedy came out and said, we're going to do this. Is that, is yeah, that? I, uh, when I uh, graduated, I went immediately to the infantry school. Uh, then I went to ranger school. Then I went to airborne school. And then I went to Germany to uh, an infantry platoon uh, and a recon platoon I commanded. Uh, the, the uh, about the time I was due to come home, I learned that we had American Special Forces folks in Laos. And so I immediately wrote the, the uh, infantry branch in Washington and volunteered to join Special Forces. So they changed my orders uh, and I came back to the US and joined the seven special forces. Then I went through all the training at Fort Bragg and then I was uh, assigned a CO of Detachment A726. Uh, and we went together as a group to uh, Camp Nandong. And, and when you... Um arrived in Vietnam, how, how did it feel? Was that, so you'd been abroad before, you'd been to a European country. So had you been in Asia before? Had you been in Okinawa or anywhere? I, I had not been in Asia before, uh, but I, my family was from Puerto Rico and I had been, uh, and my dad was uh, one of the first West Point graduates from Puerto Rico. And in his career, 
He uh, served most unusual. He served as a superintendent of the El Salvadorian military academy. And the significance of that is only that uh, when I would come, I was in a boarding school in this high school in the States. And when I would come home to Puerto Rico, I, we would, my dad and I would go hunting in the jungles of, of Nicaragua. And so I had some exposure, limited, but some exposure to, to uh, what jungles were like and, and uh, so forth. The terrain, around uh, Nam Dong. Nam Dong was about, I think, maybe 20 miles from the Laotian border, uh, south of the Ashau Valley by maybe 20 or 30 miles. Uh, and it was mountainous, uh, some flat ground. Uh, the flat ground was generally not cultivated. It was uh, covered with uh, not, not jungle. The jungle was in the mountains, which were nearby and long ridges of, of jungle covered. And, and we learned quickly the way to, to maneuver in, the, in that area was to get up halfway up the ridges and, and then go where you're going because there was no, not, not enough sunlight for there to be much undergrowth uh, when you were. It was also, as I taught at the ranger school, uh, if you walk, the, the enemy will defend the top of the ridge and the bottom of the ridge, but no, they won't defend the side of the ridge. Mm -hmm. and I had an interesting patrol at one time where I, through air recon, I, I found what looked to me like a possible enemy camp and we led patrol two nights to get to the place. They discovered us just before we, we were a hundred yards from the camp when, when they discovered us and, and uh, they were all fleeing the camp. And so I, myself and a handful of others uh, stayed in the camp, cold, wet, rainy night. Uh, and set up, then the following day they came back in and we set up a bunch of claymores and then ran like hell. Which may have been one of the reasons that the NBA uh, decided to attack Nam Dong uh, as a means of revenge for what we had done to them. And, and when they attacked Nam Dong, you, you, you were gone by then, and that's when yes. Roger uh, Donlon was there. I, I, uh, I know uh, a bit about how that went, because Roger and I have, had remained friends, and, and uh, so he and I had discussed it, but I was not there. Mm -hmm. Right, so you, so you did a tour, what, a six-month tour? It was a six-month tour, commanding uh, the camp and, and uh, we had, unlike many of the camps uh, along the border, we did not have mountain yards in my camp. We had a Vietnamese that appeared with dragoons of the streets of Hue and Da Nang. But we also had a unique group of Chinese. Uh, there's a group. Chinese called Nungs, N-U-N-G-S. And I think we were the only camp that the, new, the Nungs were recruited by Special Forces Headquarters to be palace guards back at Da Nang and, 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 uh, and the Trang, where the headquarters were and all that. But my predecessor had recruited a platoon of Nungs to be part of the fighting force in the camp. And they were very good. They were very loyal. And I'm sure they had a lot to do with, with the fact that Nam Dong didn't get overrun by the uh, Viet Cong that attacked it. So, so what was, um, what sort of level of VC activity did you encounter during your six months? Uh, 
it was primarily um, activated, I, I guess, by us. Mm -hmm. It was uh, we we spent our time patrolling, uh, do, you know, doing the, the the village of Namdong. I would guess maybe two thousand souls there, uh, and. So we did a lot of civic action stuff and other stuff like that. And there was a little, there was also across this river that there was um, on the other side of town, there was a small base of the North Vietnamese, or the, excuse me, the South Vietnamese army. Uh, and they had, I think two howitzers there, uh, but they never did much of anything. But they had fired them or whatever. But they, um, all the actions we had was initiated by my detachment with the concurrence of the South Vietnamese people and soldiers there. And it was primarily patrolling and night ambush. Except for the, the, the biggest event was the one I told you about, finding this camp and then doing a stay behind patrol and waiting for them to come back and then blowing the flame wars and running like that. So, so if you're that far up in the Highlands at the time, um, is it fair to say you didn't really have much uh, use from helicopters? It was all sort of driving in in trucks and. Uh, oh, kind of the um, we use helicopters rarely. Uh, we use them certainly for for medevac on a couple of occasions. We had some wounded, mm -hmm. and the uh, but most of our stuff. We, we would have to open a road. There was a road that led from, from uh, the village of Namdong out to Highway 19 uh, along the coast. And every once in a while, we would get one or two trucks uh, and we would have to send up, we had a couple of trucks too, old World War II trucks. And we would send out a party to secure the road coming in uh, to our camp, and then we could get the supply. We also got resupplied by air a lot, uh, airdrops. And the, uh, that was always interesting because they would parachute animals down to us. And the, uh, in some cases were cows and pigs. The cows and pigs were strapped to a parachute and they tended to defecate on the way down. So you didn't want to be on the landing zone. The, the uh, chickens were in wheat, wicker baskets, and they would all try and fly because they were coming down. Uh, so that, that we we got our fresh food that way. That does sound hilarious. So, um, in terms of your gear at the time, just out of interest, would you have been wearing duck hunter or olive green? Um, we we were olive green. We didn't have a camel gear in those days and and weapon wise you'd have had a what an m1 carbine or m2 carbine m2 carbine mm -hmm. that i i carried an m2 carbine mm -hmm. uh we had uh, bars we had m1 rifles the, the troops had m1 rifles mm -hmm. uh the uh 30 caliber um, right, okay. And and then, um, so you have your tour there um, with the A-team kind of building the building up the border security area, I'm guessing, to stop the infiltration of VC, um, yeah. you know, in from Laos. So after you rotated back, what happened then? Well, I, uh, I came back, I still had six months left in Special Forces assignment. So I was engaged primarily in training Roger Donlan's detachment. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, really spending time telling them about it, going over maps and whatever, and routes and patrol things we had done. And then uh, we, we uh, had a simulated camp out the place called Camp McCall. And we spent a week or 10 days out there uh, sort of rehearsing and, and explain what the life would be like. Mm -hmm. 
Then, then uh, that completed my tour, and uh, the Army sent me to the uh, Armored Officers Career Course. Uh, typically, I would have gone to the infantry, but they, uh, for whatever reason, they sent me to the Armored Officers Career Course. And then I had orders to go to Korea. And uh, this is sort of typical behavior on my part from a military career. I did not want to go to Korea. I kept calling infantry branch assignments, people saying, you know, it makes no sense to, for you to send me to Korea. I've been, you're sending all these units to Vietnam. I am experienced in the fighting in the jungles of Vietnam. I've been there, I can be helpful. I had a footlocker, literally, a footlocker full of uh, books on counterinsurgency that I've read and to include the British Small War, Small War Manual, which was, by the way, the best of the, of the books I had, I had read to prepare me for mm -hmm. uh, going over there. Two days before I was supposed to go to Korea, I uh, got a phone call at 4 a.m. which said, uh, need you in 48 hours, uh, we need you to report to Fort Benning. And I said, Fort Benning? What the hell is happening to Fort Benning? I don't want to go to Fort Benning. I want to go to Vietnam. The guy says to me, shut up and go to Fort Benning and I did. Turned out the day I got, I, I drove out in Oklahoma at the time. It, by the time I got to Fort Benning, President Johnson came on TV and said that we we're assigning the first cavalry division to Vietnam. And, but there was no first cavalry division. Uh, there was a brigade that had been used to test the aerosol concepts and whatever. So it, it was a crush of people coming in to get assigned. They wanted to assign me as a signal officer for the first brigade. I told them, I, I don't know squat about being a signal officer. I have a combat everyone's badge. I've been in the jungles. I know what to do. I can help train these people. And uh, the guy told me, shut up and do what you're told. I didn't. I uh, went out and a friend of mine told me about Hal Moore and the second, seventh cab. So I went over to see him. He uh, interviewed me. He said, I'd like to keep you, but I, you know, I'm just a lieutenant colonel. Uh, go see the brigade commander. Went to the brigade commander. The brigade commander called the personnel boss of the division that he wanted to call. And he said, hey, I have this captain here. This is a phone call, which I listened to because he Colonel Brown was named to create you know, put in speaker. I have this captain here named Nadal, and the guy says, where is that son of a bitch? He was supposed to be in the first brigade. And they, uh, they finally settled my future by letting me stay with the first cab, I mean, with the first of the seven, Cal Moore, which was absolutely, uh, it, Colonel, eventually Lieutenant General Hal Moore was the best soldier I've ever served under. Just a wonderful, wonderful guy. Abided by all the strictures of duty on our country. So you, so you went out to Vietnam with with his unit then, and uh, to become um, the first Air Mobile Brigade. Is that right? He com he commanded the first of seventh Cav initially, first battalion of seventh cavalry, and I was. For about a month, I was the intelligence officer, the S2, and then I took command of a rifle company, infantry company, which I did for six months. Then became the operations officer of the second battalion, seventh cat. Um, okay. Still in the same brigade. We had lots of, uh, you know, we're obviously the Battle of LC X ray and the subsequent events of the uh, next couple of days are what people think about when they hear 7th Cab, but we had big fights uh, in January and February and uh, March in the Valley for Bong Song. Uh, Bong Song 1 and Bong Song 2. Uh, that was fights against 
combine the NBA and, and uh, native, you know, Viet Cong. What, what area was this um, in? Uh, it's it was in Tukor, uh, and it was north. The Bongsan is sits right. It's a lovely area uh, on the ocean, beautiful beach. Uh, then then you have this big flat uh, rice paddy field, but it's surrounded by a big mountain mountain ridge. So there's there were several villages in this valley. With, with the ocean on one side and the big ridge on the other. And the, uh, we air assaulted in there uh, once in February and we were there for a month. Took some, some number of casualties. Uh, there was a famous cover, Black Magazine had a cover of a soldier with a bandaged head. And it was taken, I know, that was when I was the commanding officer still. Uh, and that, that was in a cemetery where we got pinned down for a while. But then we had we went away and then came back about a month and a half later for a second time. So um, when you deployed with the CAV, um, from what I understand, they had M16s at this point. Right. By that, by this time, we had jungle fatigue and jungle boots, and, and uh, no, we didn't have jungle boots. That was part of the pro an issue. It became we hadn't been issued them, and the uh, after I took over my company, I noticed that the uh, the soles we had the old fashioned boots, the leather boots with a stitched sole. Well. The constant moisture, the stitched soles were rotting out, and the soldiers flap mm -hmm. as they walked along. And, and we were using medical tape to tape the things together. Finally, I sent my supply sergeant and two bottles of bourbon down to Quignon, and he came back with uh, boots and uniforms. Great. So you were kitted out, and then I guess fairly soon after this, you would have been, you know, you, you got this uh, this this mission being briefed up to, to to do this full air mobile assault into the the area, the Yardrang Valley. Right. We had we had made uh, a couple of air assaults, sort of rehearsals uh, after we got there in the first month. We were, you know, trying out things and testing the helicopters and all that. Much of which had already been done back at, at the aerosol test at Fort Benning. The, uh, and when we got to, to our, our base was a place called Anke, which was on Highway 19 between Pleiku and uh, Trang. No, Pleiku and Quignon. And it was halfway, but when we got there, you know, uh, October, I think, first of October, something like that, uh, maybe, maybe September, uh, it was nothing but a rice paddies. Uh, so we had to build a camp and the, uh, you know, lay the barbed wire and certain fences all around and Register the artillery, and we were living in pup tents and small tents initially. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the one of the necessities was to keep the center of that rice paddy area. That would be the landing field for the helicopters, and you couldn't use heavy equipment to flatten that out because. If you did that, you would expose the dust and dirt, and chopper blades would whip, get a lot of dust in the air, and that was bad for the engines. Mm -hmm. So one of the bizarre things was seeing a whole bunch of soldiers out there with bayonets cutting grass because we didn't have any other tools 
we to use to, to uh, create what we became known as a golf course. Mm. It was where all the, all the helicopters were parked. Right, and and um, so when the time comes for the battle, you're you're commanding. Did you say B Company? Commanding A Company. A Company. Okay. And what was your role in 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 the uh, what was the role of A Company? Well, the uh, the first uh, I have to back up. Mm -hmm. We had received. An alert, we being the division, that there were North Vietnamese troops arriving in Cambodia and that they had started, they launched an attack on a special forces camp called Play Me. Mm -hmm. Now, based on readings and, and knowledge, common knowledge, we all knew that the, or we all suspected that the attack on Play Me was a lure to then attack a relief force, which is what the Viet Minh had done to the French over and over again. Uh, so sure enough, they attacked and then the uh, South Vietnamese had an armored uh, column, tanks and 113s, and they came down the highway that went from Pleiku down to the camp. What the NVA didn't realize was by that time we were established and operating as first guy back at MK, uh, we moved one or two batteries of artillery with the Chinooks helicopters within range of the road but far enough that they didn't, the NBA didn't know we were there. Mm -hmm. And uh, plus we had close support aircraft stacked. So when the Enver, when the South Vietnamese convoy came out the, that highway to the camp, they launched it, the NBA launched the ambush and basically the air was obliterated them and our artillery, uh, and there wasn't much, there weren't many captains on the American side, there were a lot on the NBA side. That triggered the first segment of, of the battles of, of Lake of uh, Idrang, which was the, the first brigade. We were, I was in the third brigade with Elmo. The first brigade went in and scarfed around the area, and our, we had a very good unit called the uh, Ninth Cav, which was a real scout uh, element for the division. The little self-organized platoons of infantry, scout ships, and gunships. Mm -hmm. We could put them down, and they could do all sorts of things. Uh, so they went out there. They found a hospital and they they um, had a wonderful ambush one night where they almost uh, got overrun. And there's a story associated with all that, what happened and why and so forth. After two weeks, they took them out and brought us in and the third brigade. And our task was to find the enemy initially. But we were we spent two weeks hacking through the trails and jungle and didn't find squat. And we were looking in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, when we have about two days left before we get relieved by the other brigade, uh, the brigade commander gets a report that there's some activity down in, in this by this ridge called Chupon Mountain, the Chupon Ridge. And uh, so we go out and reconnoiter with, you know, the, the chain of command, Hal Moore and the company commanders get in the chopper and we go out and look for landing zones in this area. We find one that we sort of like, it was right next to the ridge. Uh, 
and we call it LZ Akrae. And following day, using eight helicopters, took forever to uh, move the rifle companies in. It took because we were we were half, half hour to forty minutes flying time away from LZ Akrae. And, and how, how many um, how many men loaded with gear could you get on each slick? We we could put usually six six riflemen into into the Huey because they had two door gunners and following the co-pilot and the, the they had a machine gun on, on each door that all that added weight. Uh, right, so you got forty eight guys in a in a chalk coming in. Eight, eight, yeah, that's right. And so they come in, they take out a round trip. B Company was the first one committed. And so they went in and fortuitously, shortly after they landed, they captured an NVA soldier. And we had a Vietnamese interpreter with us. We interrogated him and we said, what are you doing here? And he said, oh, I got lost, I got separated. Many of us thought he was really a deserter. But, um, he, alerted, he said, well, where, where's, where are your forces? How many, who's here? And he said, well, there's two regiments right here, uh, the 33rd and, and the, uh, I forget the other one, uh, 66th, I think. And he said, well, where are they? And he points to the ridge which is 200 meters to that from the landing zone. Uh, so that Hal Moore, one, one of his wonderful traits was the ability to react to, to changes and things. He was always thinking ahead, what do I do it? What do I do it? And uh, so what he did was change, whoops, the mission now has changed. The mission is survival. And if we have to, if, if, if we lose this landing zone, we're asked to take us. Uh, got to hold the landing zone because that's where we're going to get every supply. That's the way we get the rest of our unit in. And that's uh, the way we take our, our wounded out. Mm -hmm. So the mission had been to, to Cloverleaf. Once we got all the battalion in, it, we reached the take a sector, we'd go out and pull the leaf, and, but that didn't happen. Uh, he put, immediately put B Company on the side, and I was next to B Company, but I, I, I had the company that was closest to the ridge line. And eventually, the enemy came down the ridge and they hit my second platoon. That was the first contact. And then C Company still hadn't quite landed with all of its people yet. Uh, so we, we were defending, surviving. Mm -hmm. uh, we had good air support. We had a problem. I had a problem with my company with artillery support. And the problem, and this may be more detailed than, than you're interested in, uh, the problem was that the, uh, there, there was one fire direction frequency for the battalion. And the B Company forward observer was on it. And when my forward observer tried to get on it, they chased him off the air. We were, we were already doing a fire mission, whatever. Uh, so the initial mission became get everyone in here, defend this landing zone. Well, what happened next was that B Company, Hal told B Company to send a, re, a, re, a platoon out to reconnoiter. And that platoon went out and they spotted some Vietnamese and the impetuous lieutenant went running after them and eventually 
but the, he then got caught off. So then the focus changed. We have to defend, but we rescue up the tomb. And the uh, so. And that, that was Sergeant Ernie Savage and the Lost. That was Sergeant Ernie Savage was uh, one of my heroes. I mean, I I felt quickly. Here, here's a young, twenty two or twenty three year old Sergeant E five. Uh, typically, would not be a squad leader; he'd be a team leader in the squad. Uh, the platoon leader's killed. Platoon sergeant's killed. General command evolves down to Sergeant Savage. And from the time he took command to the following day when he got rescued, not another soldier died. He surrounded himself with artillery fire. Every time he moved out there, he'd call an artillery strike on it. They were having to take, they ran out of bandages and dressings for the soldiers that were wounded and they were taken with dead soldiers and put them on live soldiers. My, my story, uh, I had been in command for about 30 days when we went to El Ziafra. So I didn't know the soldiers very well or the non-commissioned officers. Uh, so when, the, when we got in that fight, my mental attitude was you have got to prove to your soldiers you're worthy. And you've got to show them that you're gonna abide by the rules you lay down. One of the rules I laid down was, we will not leave, and, and this was also how more, we will not leave anyone behind on the battlefield, uh, wounded or dead will get you home. So when the battle starts, I'm still, in the process of receiving my incoming troops. So I, I run back to the, when the lift is coming in, I run back to the landing zone, get them platoon together, and take them to where their sector is, get them placed, go back to the little CP. Next load comes in, I run back, pick them up. But in the meantime, this battle is moving. The, the, uh, my second platoon, with a machine gun named Bill Beck, who was a super guy, uh, is getting the initial front of the, of the attack. And they're doing a lot of damage to the bad guys. Uh, so the third time I come back, so happens that I run into the CP command post of B Company, uh, commanded by John Heron, who's a West Point type of mine. And, uh, he says to me, you better get down because you got to get shot. And so I took his advice, look up down. And then I see the platoon sergeant of two seventh, of the platoon sergeant of my third platoon. And I said, I asked him, where's the town Taft? And he says, uh, the Taft is dead. I said, well, where is he? Where's his body? His body's out in, in the creek bed up, up ahead. And I had said to them, you know, we don't leave people behind. And so I grabbed my radio operator and said, we're gonna go get him. And forward. Uh, the enemy's out, out there. Uh, I got in the creek bed, found Lieutenant Taft. He's dead, but I find another soldier who's still alive. Now, some, someone criticized me for this, which I can understand. In the heat of the moment, I grabbed the Lieutenant Taft's body, my radar operator, and, I, and we brought him back. But I knew full well that I had to go back a second time. So I went back a second time. This time they're throwing hand grenades at me. And the, uh, you can see, I can see the hand grenades going off right along the edge of the creek. They had this little sort of miniature German hand grenades, uh, mm -hmm. wooden handle and, and the potato masher type grenades. 
but they didn't have a lot of explosive power. Anyway, I went back a second time, read the soldier was alive, brought him back, and they, uh, he got medevaced and he lived. And mm -hmm. I was conscious when I picked him up that he lived. Then uh, at uh, four o'clock, we got told to assault to go get that platoon that's, that's been in A and B company uh, to launch an assault. Well, I, that's where the problem with, with the fire support came up. I couldn't get artillery fire, which I needed drastically. I, uh, the mortars, we had a couple of mortars, but they didn't have much ammo. Uh, anyway, what I did then was I gathered my troops in the creek bed. Uh, not, not all of them, most, most of them. And I gave them a pep talk uh, about, you know, you've got your brothers out there, the guys you know, whatever, we're gonna go get them, bring them back. I, I gave the command to fix bayonets. And then I said, follow me. And I personally led the assault. Uh, we had gone, not the smartest thing I have ever done, however, uh, but we had gone about 100 meters and I'm standing. One of the things that is very important in that battle is the grass. The trail was not jungle. It's a, his trees were sort of dispersed. They weren't very big trees. They were like 20 foot high trees. Some of them had this ant hills, termite hills, along the trunk of the tree that were hard as rock. Uh, anyway, I'm leading the assault and, and I have forward observer on my right, his great operator to his right, and my comma sergeant on my left is like, you know, my radio operator. When uh, I'm speaking to the forward observer, when I see this compass on his chest blow up and he drops dead, his radio operator drops dead. And on my left, my comma sergeant drops dead. Myself and the guy behind me, uh, survives. Uh, the battle is intense at this point, but as I said, it's not jungle. A lot of that had this knee high grass. And the, uh, there's a lot of lessons in, the, in my combat leadership plans because you go, you know, as S.L.A. Marshall kind of wrote books about World War II. That when a soldier goes to ground, he feels isolated. Now, in the grass, it's even worse because he can't see where his squad leader is. He can't see where his teammates are, whatever. So everyone hit the dirt. And we weren't making any headway. So I called Hal Moore and said, you know, we've taken a lot of casualties, but we're not gonna we're not gonna get there because in the grass it was very difficult. And the uh, so I called for a kind of I was able to get the issue of, of the communications resolved and I called for emission of, of uh, smoke, but we didn't have smoke, so how more, they told how more, we were out of smoke, but we had white phosphorus. Mm -hmm. And they fired the white phosphorus. And uh, they didn't know where I called it, but I had called it just a short, you know, maybe 50 meters, 70 meters ahead of my position. And when it came out, not expecting white phosphorus, it scared the bejesus out of me because I thought, I've killed my soldiers. 
Uh, but I had, we had, didn't take any casualties in WP. So I, they were so good. I said, hey, let's do that again. So I fired another volume. White phosphorus is much better than the smoke round. It's thick, creates casualty, and it just lang it just sort of sits there, doesn't blow away. Uh, so then I told my company to withdraw. I told them, well, we can't get, get there, so we're going to get, go back to Greek then. And he said, okay. And I stayed out there myself and I had grabbed I grabbed another, another soldier put the radio up on his back at that that come with you and there was a, a second rate operator who was standing behind me and he and I was unscathed the guys on both sides was died and I had the radio operator and I said Let's fire at WP again. Then I stayed out there until all my guys got back. And I tell you all that because after that battle, um, commanding A company was easy. I had done what I told myself I had to do, which is earn the trust of the soldiers. And to this day, for the last 30 years, 35 years, I'm organizing reunions of those of us who fought at LZ actually. Mm -hmm. And we have them coming up in November 17, something like that, in bed, like that. Um, but I have, if you could see the office where I'm sitting, uh, there's a big plaque on the wall that says, Nice things about me was given to me my soldiers. And I have a bayonet that was a spray bayonet that was given to me by my soldiers. Mm. Yeah, I have jackets that were given to me by my soldiers. Yeah, so we, we still have a relationship. They still uh, they remember. Uh, Just good things you can do it right. So, so what happened? So you've you've used the white phosphorus as a screen. You've pulled back to the creek bed, and should we take it from there? The, the night is fairly quiet. There, there's uh, as happens. You know, you have your outpost out, and then you all of a sudden hear firing, and some guy you call. Uh, on the radio or the cell landline, and uh, what the hell are you shooting at? Well, I heard some noise or something, or whatever. You know. They get spooky, uh, but it was a fairly uneventful evening. We got another. All, all our companies are deployed, and, and around five o'clock on that day, uh, after my assault or whatever, the uh, a company from the second seventh cap joins us, and they get put in place on my on my left flank. So that strengthens that. That's the avenue approach coming down the, the mountain. So we re reinforce that. Uh, the following day, early in the morning, the, the most threatening event to us was the second morning when uh, what was a full-size battalion assaults our C company. And uh, one of the things I'll never forget is the C company commander, Bob Edwards, calling on the radio, I've been shot in the chest and uh, I... Uh, or someone to replace me, uh, etc. And Al Moore tries on two occasions to send someone, uh, a lieutenant, recon platoon leader, 
to take over, but he can't make it across. He gets shot trying to get across the landing zone. Uh, and the, but the, the company, C Company does a great job. Uh, they, they hang on. All their, most of their, their NCOs are wounded. I think two of the three lieutenants were wounded, uh, but they stay in flight. And uh, so by noon time of the second day, things are, we're getting reinforced. Uh, the second battalion, the fifth cav comes in and they go out to uh, recover that lost platoon and the enemy has withdrawn. It, it, there's no, no real fight in to them. Uh, then on the third day, we get pulled out. My unit, my company, we were all under strength. The battalion was supposed to have something like 760 people. We had 400 going into L at the LZ. And there are reasons for that. Uh, Number one, we took with us anyone who had 60 days left in the army would go. But it, but we went by ship, so it took 32 days for us to get there from, from South Carolina through the Panama Canal up to refuel in LA. And had to drop a soldier up in Hawaii because he had got up under Titus. Then we get hit by a typhoon, so we had to turn around and go the other way. Anyway, it took a long time to get to Queen Arm. And so that all these soldiers that we took had been sent home and we had no replacements yet. Mm -hmm. And they, they uh, um, oh, and, and then there was that malaria. The Army Medical Corps in, in, uh, intelligence aspects of the Army Medical Corps screwed up because we were taking malaria pills, but it was the wrong type of malaria that was up in the highlands of Vietnam. There's a very virulent kind of type of malaria called falsiprim malaria that attacks the brain. And we had a lot of guys come down with that. Uh, then they thought the army woke up and we had to take two pills, a yeah, big one and a small one to fight off the malaria. Mm. Uh, so we had a combination of the malaria, the people rotating, so we were under strength. I had, in my company, which I had 98, it was supposed to be 160, I had 98 soldiers when I went into LZ after I, I had 16 killed and 22 wounded. Uh, so about half the unit, yeah. Yeah, that's a tough battle. And then uh, you, you get to, about day three, and, and, and I remember that there was movement um, to another LZ, Albany, was it? Well, yeah, that, uh, that's that, that's a, a different, whole different story. Mm -hmm. uh, we told we have to get out of the, the Air Force decides they got to put P 52 strikes along that ridge, mm -hmm. two on Mountain. And uh, so we have to be five miles away. Uh, Something about, that tells you something about the accuracy of those 352s. Uh, but anyway, we got choppered out to, to uh, back to uh, Lake Booth. The, the uh, 27 cab was told to walk to an, another landing zone called LZ Albany. Mm -hmm. uh, and much to the disgust of myself and others, um, the battalion commander, I fault him for what happened. I mean, the soldiers, I eventually became the S3 of the 27 cab. I spent the rest of my tour with them. They, they were, you know, officers and soldiers and so forth were no different than the ones in 27 cab. The difference was the commanders. And the uh, when they when two seventh cab walked out, they walked out in single file. It was about five miles away, and the uh, 
they didn't have flank security. They thought, you know, the attitude was, well, this is all over, the battle's over. Uh, the only company of theirs that got any action at LZ Extra was the company that came in to reinforce was that first night. They, got hit, they were part of the people that hit the following day. Uh, but uh, when they got hit, they had been tracked. The NBA were tracking them as they were walking down the battalion size ambush that they had set up. And the, uh, to make matters worse, when the head of the column reached LZ Albany, the battalion commander called all the company commanders forward. So as you are wont to do, they called the radio operators with them. So the company commanders and the two radio operators are with the uh, battalion commander up at LZ Albany. The rest of the battalion sprung out in a long line. And the, uh, when the enemy launches its ambush, uh, they killed a whole bunch of our guys. And, and so some of, the, some of the units, platoons, uh, the lieutenants were there and, and they organized the guys and they fought. Mm -hmm. There was one company from another battalion, second and fifth cav that was attached. And they were to, to two seventh cav. And they were the very last unit in the uh, column. And the company commander of that company had walked that whole line up there to the to the uh, landing zone, LC Albany. And when the battle started, he took off running. He was a former football player. And he ran the whole length of the column. His, one of his RTOs, radar players were killed. He and the other guy made it back to the, his company. He could organize them, get them, get them sort of uh, in a defensive position. They didn't uh, suffer near the, the damage uh, that the other guys did. The, uh, but that was a debacle. And it was caused by the battalion commander that should have, you know, should have known better. You just don't. Mm -hmm. Assume that they had a battle like we had just had for two days, that the bad guys aren't still around somewhere. Mm. I think, um, did you get a sense they were, because um, I think in history discussions, you know, people talk about, um, I think it was General Ziap on the other side, and he was looking to test you know, the, the strength of the US soldier. Did you, did you get a sense that, that was what was going on, that there were probing? No, I think, I think, by the way, mm -hmm. I went back uh, a few years later. So I had, I had a photograph hand, handy. I, would, I don't know. I have a photograph of myself, Al Moore, and some of the company commanders. We, we went back with ABC News and they did a show. Mm. And with the commanders, the Vietnamese commanders on the scene. So we we and they went back to LZ Africa. Mm -hmm. And this became a TV show in the, in the US. Um, and I, I learned, now you might say, well, how, how did you communicate? We had very, very good North Vietnamese interpreters who spoke better English than I do. Uh, and the, uh, I, I developed a, a relationship with a Colonel, Colonel Took, who had been, a, he'd been attack, attacking my rifle gun for two days. And we found that out as we were discussing. And the, uh, it was uh, very, to this day, it's one of the things that in my life that I really value. It's a chance to talk to him. And we have very nice dialogues. Uh, I'd ask him, well, why was it, what, when you guys captured American equipment, what were you looking for? What were radios and, and something else? He said, uh, first aid equipment, 
so forth. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And but when we got to Hanoi, yeah, when we flew into Hanoi as the first day of that flight, we rested. And the following day, they took us to the North Vietnamese War Museum in Hanoi. And General Jacques gave us a lecture on the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. He did it in French, uh, which I could understand to some degree, but they also had translators. Uh, so I consider that, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the whole trip was just super for me as, as someone who likes to read military history and to hear General Jean talk about the Indian food uh, was, was 